of background on Mr. Rosner. He was born in 1932 in rural Hungary, and his early life was shaped by the rigor and discipline of an Orthodox Jewish upbringing and a literate and sensitive mother. Overwhelmed by the Holocaust at the age of 12, he was the only member of his family to survive the gas chambers of Auschwitz and the other horrors of the Nazi concentration camps. Bernie came to the United States in 1948 at the age of 16 and received his education at Cornell University and Harvard Law School. He spent his 35 years career in the legal department of the Safeway food chain, the last 10 as the company's chief legal officer. After his retirement in 1994, he and his friend, Franz Tubach, sorry if I messed that up, co-wrote a book, An Uncommon Friendship, which tells the unique story of two boys trapped on opposite sides of the Holocaust. The library does have a copy. It's currently checked out. You can put a hold on it if you'd like. And now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Rosner. Can everyone hear me? Great. Thank you, Ms. Shipley, for inviting me and for the introduction. Thank you all for taking the time to come and listen to me and hopefully give me a chance to answer some of your questions, if you should have any, and if time permits. When I first talked to a group like this about my story, shortly after publication of the book in 2001, there were still a fair number of veterans of World War II in the audience. Some of them were part of units that liberated concentration camps like mine, and at least one, the very camp I was in. I told them that I owed them big time, because if they had been just a few days later, I wouldn't be here before you telling my story. During the 22 years that have passed since then, the number of such veterans has dwindled, and it won't be very long before there won't be any. The same is true about Holocaust survivors. I was just 12 years old when I was unloaded on the train platform of the Auschwitz concentration camp. And last January, I observed my 91st birthday. I believe that there is some historic significance to the fact that the current generation of audiences will be among the last who will hear the story of those tumultuous and terrible years from someone who actually lived through them. While the early part of my life was dominated by turmoil, upheaval, and horror, most of the latter part of it was, sent, was spent under slightly more benign circumstances practicing law in California. The fact that I chose the law as a career is due to a number of reasons, but there is little question in my mind that after witnessing the breakdown of the basic norms of civilized behavior, and the repudiation of the rule of law, tolerance, and human dignity, I was strongly drawn to a profession which ideally, at least, holds up those goals. And that were so brutally trampled upon by the perpetrators of the Nazi atrocities. For almost 45 years following the war, I put the events and memories of that earlier period out of my mind. During those intervening years, I've heard and read about Holocaust survivors and even their children who would not talk or think of the things that happened because the memories were too painful. 
I have to admit that this was not the case with me. I shut the past out simply because I did not consider it relevant. I was in a new country, starting a new life, and my focus has always been on the future, not the past. Then, starting about the mid-1980s, 40 years after the war, two things happened that changed my attitude. First, I came to realize that you can't chop, chop your life up in little compartments and jettison the parts that you consider irrelevant. Your past is part of you whether you like it or not. Second, as the representative of the Safeway supermarket chain for whom I worked and who was a major contributor, I attended the opening and dedication of the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. in 1992. While there, I was given access to the archives, including the log of prisoners entering the Mauthausen concentration camp, the camp I was transferred to from Auschwitz in September of 1944. I knew that there were no records in Auschwitz of my arrival because the authorities knew that most of those who arrived would not survive and they did not bother to give you a, a name and a registration and a tattoo on your arm until you were selected for a work detail, which I never was in Auschwitz. As I stared at the microfish, there was the following entry for September 19, 1944. Bernat Rosner, prisoner number 103705, 105705. As I looked at that banal, bureaucratic notation, the floodgates of memory and emotion open and overwhelm me. In that regard, you must remember that there is not a picture, document, or any other tangible thing that connects me to my former life. The upshot of these reflections and experience was the decision to tell my story. When I was ready to do so, a series of coincidences, which in their own way are as unique as any other aspect of my life, brought it about that I met and made friends with a man by the name of Fritz Tubach. Tubach, Fritz's life and background and history could not have been any more different than mine. While I was a Jew and a survivor of Auschwitz, Fritz was raised in wartime Germany. His father was a Nazi, and Fritz himself, in his early youth, was a member of the Jungvolk, the Cub Scout equivalent of the Hitler Youth. By the time we met in the 1980s, we had both become Americans. We both accepted the principle that you are responsible for your own action and not for those of your father or other members of your nation or race. Over the years, we formed a friendship. We discovered that we both had fascinating stories to tell, and we decided to tell our stories together. The result was the book called An Uncommon Friendship, the title for which is rather obvious. 
which has enjoyed a fair degree of success, has been translated into German, Italian, and Dutch, and which is the main reason when I, while I'm standing, or actually sitting before you today. The rest of what I have to say will consist mainly of telling you something about myself, where I came from, what I went through, and how I ended up where I am. I was born 91 years ago in a smallish town by the name of Tub in rural Hungary. For the first 12 years of my life, I had a basically normal and happy childhood. An important part of my personality and makeup was shaped by the rigor and discipline of a Jewish Orthodox upbringing and a sensitive and literate mother. Both of these influences imbued me with an abiding love for books and learning. Anti-Semitism was certainly not unknown in Hungary, and it existed in a good measure in our town, going as far back as I can remember. It was institutional in terms of laws that restricted the freedom of Jews from practicing certain professions or owning land and limiting the number of Jews who could be admitted to law, medical, journalism, and other professional schools. It was also personal in terms of Jews being bullied and held up to contempt and hostility, not by any means by all of the non-Jewish population, but by a substantial segment who were followers or members of the Hungarian version of the Nazi party or similar racist or factions. But this was not the virulent and deadly doctrine of extermination as preached and practiced by Hitler and his thugs. And the anti-Semitic undercurrents running through Hungarian political and cultural life did not significantly affect our in everyday life in my basically happy and tranquil childhood. All this changed with dramatic suddenness on a very specific day, March 19, 1944, relatively late in the course of World War II. I remember the day very well. I was on my way home from a study session in preparation for my upcoming bar mitzvah when a neighbor woman asked me if I had heard the news. When I asked what news, she told me that the Germans had taken over the country and the government. The effects of the Nazi takeover on the Jews of Hungary were immediate and disastrous. I will limit my account to what happened to me, to my family, and to the Jewish community of Tub. Within days following the takeover, the stream of anti-Jewish edicts began. Jews could not travel without specific permission. Soon they could not travel at all. Prominent families in the com community, as well as those suspected of subversive activities or associations, began to disappear. By mid-April, all Jews had to wear a prominent yellow star on their outer clothing. 
I remember the night before this edict went into effect, sitting in our living room with my mother sewing the yellow stars on our sweaters and jackets. By Bin Bay, all the Jews were herded into a ghetto. My family was lucky in this respect. Our home was within the boundaries that were designated as part of the ghetto. But our three-room home, instead of just housing my immediate family, also became home for numerous relatives, as I recall, between 16 to 18, whose residence was outside the ghetto boundary. The end of the Jewish community in Tub came during the latter part of June 1944. On 24 hours notice, we were ordered to be ready for departure in front of our homes with no more than one suitcase per person. Three images stand out for me from the day on which we were mar marched down the main street of Tub to the unused brickyard next to the railroad station. The first was the attitude and behavior of the non-Jewish inhabitants. A relatively small number of them stood on the sidewalk and were, her, were as we were herded by, by and made jeering comments like, you Jews are finally getting what's coming to you. The great majority of the town people simply retreated into their homes closed their blinds to shut out the sight of their fellow citizens being driven down the street like cattle. The second memory is, at, is of the public school of all places where I witnessed my mother's humiliation by being stripped naked in a crowded room and hand-searched by Nazi thugs. The third memory was at the brickyard with only bare earthen floor for accommodations, where an elderly woman standing up to recite her Sabbath prayers was clubbed bloody and unconscious by one of the guards. From Tub, we were shipped to a collection point about 50 miles away, where we were unloaded onto a large open field. There, we were joined by approximately several, seven to 10,000 others collected from other ghettos in that part of Hungary. From there, during the first week of July, 1944, we were loaded into cattle cars, between 40 to 50 men, women, and children per car, headed for Auschwitz. We arrived at Auschwitz-Birkenau on approximately July 7. I remember it was a Friday. By the time the sliding doors of the f freight car, which remained mostly locked, throughout the five-day journey was opened. There were at least a half a dozen corpses or near corpses in the car and many more whose minds became unhinged. On the train platform at Auschwitz, there was chaos, brutality, and confusion. But my immediate family my mother, my father, and my younger brother were still together. 
The first thing that happened as we stood there dazed was an, an order on the loudspeaker that those in charge of each cattle car, and my father was so designated, even though his duties were never made clear or explained, were to report to the authorities. So my father left us, and that was the last that we saw him. Next, an announcement was made that males and females should separate because showers would be given. By now, my mother was quite frightened and told my brother and me to stay with her. I told her that I was not about to take a shower with a bunch of women. My mother did not argue with me, but left me with the admonition, whatever you do, stay with your brother. With those words, she left us, and I never saw her again. Next, all the males were ordered to line up in a single file to be inspected by two SS officers. The SS officer looked at each person as he reached the head of the line, and those who looked able-bodied and fit for work were sent to the right. Those who looked too young or too old or otherwise unfit for work were sent to the left. My brother, who was just over 10 years old, was in, ahead of me in the line, and the SS officer, without hesitation, sent him to the left. Harking back to my mother's admonition, I followed my little brother to the left. I was about two steps past the Nazi when he reached over, grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, and shoved me over to the right. To this day, I don't know whether the German thought that I just might be able and fit enough to work or whether he was simply irritated by my making my own decision. In any case, that shove from the left to the right made the difference on that day between my ending up in the gas chambers within the hour, as did the rest of my family, and my serving it, or at least that day's screening process. My ordeal obviously did not end with that fateful shove. Every day for the next 10 months, until my liberation by the Americans during the first week of May of 1945, was a battle for survival. First at Auschwitz, it was a matter of trying to avoid being sent to the gas chambers. This was so because even though I survived that initial screening, I kept flunking the physicals that the prisoners were subjected to in order to qualify for a permanent job assignment. By mid-September of 1944, I realized that the, most of the remaining persons in my barracks consisted of the old, the sick, and those like me, too young to be selected for work. I didn't at that point fully grasp what was going on, but my instincts told me that I was not in a good place. At that point, in a desperate move, 
that is described in the book, I managed to get into a transport out of Auschwitz to the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria. It's ironic that in the annals of the Holocaust, Mauthausen is considered one of the most brutal and deadly of concentration camps. For me, it was a lifesaver because in Mauthausen, they put you in a gas chamber only if you were literally unable to get up and go to work. From then on, my battle to stay alive was mostly a matter of fighting and trying to survive mm -hmm. hunger, cold, brutal beatings, overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, and just about every other privation known to man. To illustrate, let me give you a brief picture of a typical day at the Mauthausen concentration camp. I will start with bedtime in the evening. Our sleeping accommodations were triple-decker bunk beds. But instead of one person per bed, we were squeezed three, sometimes four persons per bed. The result was horrible overcrowding with people fighting with each other for every inch of available space. There was no mattress on the beds, sometimes some filthy ground-up straw, often just wooden boards. One night, I offered a deal to my bunkmates. If they let me have the single blanket we were allotted, I would go down and sleep down under the, on the floor under the bed and free up some space on the bed. My offer was accepted, and that was a win-win situation in Mauthausen. We were woken up about 6.30 in the morning, mostly with shouts, but if the overseers thought we were not quick enough, then with clubs. Our barracks, housing about a hundred men and two, had two faucets and one three-hole latrine for our sanitary needs. By seven, we had to be outside the barracks and line up for roll call. We had to stand and wait for the German officer to show up to receive the roll call report from the barracks chief who was a prisoner. Sometimes the German would not show up for an hour or more, and we had to stand there in rain or snow or bitter cold until he showed up to receive the report. This was during the late fall and winter months, and we only had thin striped prisoner's outfit for clothing. After roll call, we had breakfast, which consisted of a brown, lukewarm liquid they called coffee. After breakfast, the able-bodied prisoners were sent out to work details. Since I was small and frail, I generally was not picked for work. Instead, all of us who were not picked for work had to stay outside in the often freezing cold. To ease our discomfort, we huddled together against each other for body warmth. One amusement of the more brutal overseer guards who were prisoners themselves, they just got an extra ration if they could demonstrate that they were able to do the cruel and brutal things that the Germans expected of them. 
One of their amusements was to start beating the outer layer of this huddled mass with clubs and watch the whole group break into a stampede. In the course of one of these stampedes, my feet got trampled on, resulting on cold sores that never healed during the time I was in the camps, and the scars remain to this day. For lunch, we were served a cup of greasy liquid called soup, made out of dried beets, and I hope this won't spoil your dinner with some dead maggots floating in the liquid. Our dinner consisted of a slice of bread with a square of margarine or a scoop of jam. During my, the 10 months of my imprisonment, I never had a glass of milk or a piece of fruit. The only exception was on a public street where we were carrying airplane parts and a woman was walking ahead of us eating an apple. She looked around furtively to see that there were no guards looking and then threw the half-eaten apple on the ground. I was the lucky one who picked up the apple, took a bite, and then shared the rest the spoils with my best friend. To add to our misery, the unsanitary conditions resulted in an enormous infestation of lice. We spent much of our days squirming and scratching and our evenings trying to kill the vermin that were crawling in our clothing. A very large number of prisoners contracted typhus because of the lice, and many of them died of the disease. I too contracted the disease, but fortunately, the symptoms did not show up until after I was liberated by the Americans in early May of 1945, and I was cared for and recovered in an American Army Field Hospital. When I woke up after several days of lying unconscious, I was put on a scale, and at the age of 13, I weighed 26 kilos, or about 52 pounds. After the war, many magazines and newsreels showed pictures of the cadaver-looking creatures that emerged from the camps after liberation by the Allies. I was one of them. People often ask me how I felt when we were liberated. First, I will tell you how we found out that we were liberated. This was during the first week of May of 1945. The weather was cold and miserable. It snowed the day before. We were in a temporary makeshift camp in the middle of a forest. The grand outdoor and the barrack, outside the barracks, was knee-deep in mud. Suddenly, one of the prisoners burst into our bar barracks, yelling, hey, the Germans are gone, the guards are gone. That is the way we found out that we were liberated. When we realized what was happening, did we burst into tears of joy or dance in the streets, or rather in the knee-deep mud? The answer is no. What we did was to race to the storehouse, which contained the maggot-ridden ingredients for our soup, 
ripped the sacks open, and crammed the noxious stuff into our mouths till we almost choked. I spent the first night of my freedom trying to get some sleep on one of the sacks while the lice were crawling over me and driving me to distraction. With all the brutality and deprivation, there were instances of humanity and selflessness, sometimes from unexpected quarters. Let me give you two examples. The first involved a German soldier who was one of the guards when we were being moved from Auschwitz to the Mauthausen concentration camp. The journey was by train in a cattle car, but the conditions were not nearly as terrible as the trip to Auschwitz that I described earlier. There were about 30 male prisoners per car. We had adequate sanitation and water and meager but regular meals. The guard was with his rifle was quartered with us in the cattle car. During the first day of the three-day trip, he was distant and unfriendly. By the second day, he unbent a little and for some reason took a liking to me. By that evening, he offered me some morsels from his dinner, which were of course far better than the, what the prisoners had to eat. Later that evening, he asked me to sing some songs that I remembered from my childhood. I felt that somehow in that freight car taking me to the next concentration camp, this German soldier and I had formed a bond. The second instance of some light in the dark days of my captivity involved my best friend and myself. You could not possibly survive the physical and emotional trauma of the camps without a buddy system, a friend to lean on and give support to and receive support from. In my case, I found a boy about my age in Mauthausen, the second camp I was in, and we both felt that we made a good fit. The name of this boy was Simcha, and there's a picture of the two of us in the book, which was taken shortly after the war. One night in the middle of the winter, someone stole Simcha's shoes while we were sleeping. The shoes were not much. They were basically flip-flops with wooden soles. But they were all, all we had, and they were certainly better than nothing. So the following morning, Simcha had to walk barefoot through the snow and ice to the factory we were working in about a mile away. While at work, the thief, another bigger boy, came up to us and said, guess what, I found your shoes. And if you give me one ra your ration of bread, you can have them back. Simcha and I knew that he could not possibly survive without his shoes, and neither could he survive without his ration of bread. The only solution was to try to make it for the day with a half a ration of bread for each of us and to use the other ration to redeem his shoes. We did this without discussion or question. We both took it for granted that he would do the same thing for me if it was necessary. 
People sometimes ask me if there were any good days in the camp. I tell them yes. The day I saved my friend's life with a slice of bread. Very briefly, I will tell you how I ended up where I am, how a chance encounter in the summer of 1945 changed and gave new direction to my life. By that time, with the war in Europe over, I was in a refugee camp in Italy, in the town of Modena. I was alone, just over 13 years old, ragged and hungry. There were thousands of kids like me, hustling for an extra piece of bread, or if we were really lucky, some candy or a piece of chewing gum. The only source of those goodies were the American soldiers who were stationed near our camp. So naturally, I spent much of my time hanging out near, near where the Americans were billeted. As I was standing there one day looking for a hustling opportunity, a jeep drove up loaded with four GIs and their duffel bags. I immediately ran up to the jeep, headed for the nearest soldier, and with sign language offered my services as a porter. He smiled and pointed to one of the bags. The bags was almost as big as I was, and my employer later told me that all he could see was the duffel bag and my beer heels underneath, pumping away with great energy. After I delivered the bag to his room, the soldier gave me a chocolate bar, which was the basic objective of the whole exercise, and we attempted to make conversation. We discovered that our only means of doing so was broken German. I told him about my situation. The words Mutter, Vater, Kaput were easily sliding off my tongue by then, and he was visibly moved. I told him about my situation, and it, for the next five days, he spent all of his free time with me, taking me to the movies and restaurants, treats I've never had before. We also did a lot of walking and talking. There is a picture in the book of the two of us taken by a street photographer. Five days, five days after I met him, the soldier was transferred but we started corresponding with each other. The upshot of this encounter was that after the soldier returned to the U.S. and was demobilized, he wrote me a letter offering to bring me to the U.S. and to have me become part of his family. This story by itself is unique enough. But what made it even more remarkable is that the GI who befriended me happened to be Charles Merrill Jr., the son of the founder of the Merrill Lynch financial firm. The rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> when Fritz and I embarked on our joint project, my intention was not to send a moral message. My intention was simply to tell my story because I realized that I had some obligations to fulfill. First and foremost was an obligation to my three children. 
As they grew up, they heard bits and pieces of the story, but never in a coherent and systematic way. More importantly, I kept the pain and emotion out of whatever I told them, and I realized now that this was more to protect me than to protect them. I also owed a debt to the family I lost. My father, my mother, my kid brother, and my extended family. The story of the Holocaust, of how the, how the millions were murdered, has been told many times. But their own story was not told, and I felt that it was up to me to do it. I also felt that my story was a good and fascinating yarn that was worth telling. With all the horrors and suffering, there were moments of tension, <coughs> suspense, and adventure. The old truism that often Truth is stranger than fiction, applies, I believe, to several aspects of both, my, of both my story and Fritz's story. But even though the story was not told to, sell the moral, to send a moral message, I believe that it does so nevertheless, and it does so on several levels. The most important is the need to avoid hatred, bigotry, and intolerance, and to speak out against those destructive tendencies. Finally, my story carries the message of the resilience of the human spirit and the hope for a better future for the world. Thank you. Did you make any other friends in the camps? Well, I had friends in the sense that I got to know them. Actually, uh, quite a few of the people that I was with in the camps were from the same town that I was from. Uh, but uh, as a special friend, I only had Simcha because we were we had to survive, and we did so together, and we helped each other along the way. What happened to your friend after the liberation? Well, he, we were in uh, the final place that we were together was a orphanage for war caused injuries and, orphan, and, and orphans. And the, the, the orphanage was run by Jewish soldiers who may, whose main objective after the war was to gather the remnants of the survivors and shepherd them to the extent they could toward what was then Palestine and is now Israel. My friend Simcha, unfortunately, was not, not lucky enough to carry the bag of a GI named J Charles Merrill, so he ended up in Israel. And uh, for many years, we lost contact with each other. But uh, about in the mid-90s, my former wife and I made a trip to Israel, and I decided to try to contact him. And I was able to do so through the Yad Vashem, which is the big museum in Jerusalem commemorating the Holocaust. And uh, a lady there told me that uh, just the week before, they actually had a TV program about this orphanage, which has become quite famous in the history of Israel. And she was so energized when I told her my, 
my situation that she kept making phone call after phone call and was able to contact actually my friend's wife, uh, who seemed like that one was still working and she knew the story, she never met me, but she knew the story and she said, my God, I think he'll have a heart attack when I tell him what's going on. So that, the two evenings later we made a date to have dinner in a hotel in Jerusalem. He was about the only person in Israel who didn't speak English, so he brought his son along as a translator, and we had a very emotional uh, encounter. We talked about the famous slice of bread. He also, in 2006, came to the U.S. and visited, stayed with us for several days, and, and uh, went back. Since then, we have, we have kept up with each other as best as we can, because I unfortunately forgot both of the languages that he spoke well, Hungarian and Hebrew, and he is about the only person in Israel who doesn't speak English. So, but, but I, I kept it up, and uh, I'm sure, sure he is, uh, I, I have not heard, he, I assume he's still around, and I intend to continue to be in touch with him. What's the message you'd have for today's youth based on what you learned? Message to? Today's young people. Well, I, I think to young people, I, and I speak quite often to young people, is this, that I hope that my story is an inspiration to when they will undoubtedly encounter rough spots and bumps on the road. And I hope that my story of survival, of resilience, will give them the message that you can overcome big adversities and bad things that happen to you uh, if you maintain hope and courage and, and curiosity to, to me. That, that's very important. Were you able to practice your Judaism in the camp? And how about today? Well, certainly in, in the camp it was impossible. You know, all, there are very stringent rituals about what you can eat and, and a lot of, lot of rules which obviously could not be observed at the, the camp. But uh, my religion stayed with me, and I don't think there's any question that that contributed to my being able to survive. I have to tell you that I am not religious now. I parted way because of a number of things, most importantly that the people, the Jewish soldiers, who gave us the first place to heal were Jews in a secular sense. As I grew up in this anti-Semitic atmosphere, you, you start believing all the things that you are called, like Jews are cowards, Jews are dirty, Jews are lazy. And here were these strapping, bold, courageous men who became my role models. So at that point, my Jewishness went from being religious to being more a secular Jewishness. And I still feel a strong affinity to the Jewish people, even though I'm not a practitioner of the religion. What do you attribute your resilience well, to? Some of it probably is physical, in the sense that when I was started in camp, I was 12, and I was able to basically, my system was able to shut down from growing. Youngsters who were even a few years older than me who were 
in the middle of their growth time, contracted tuberculosis and other diseases and couldn't make it. But that's, that's the physical reason. And uh, there's obviously the emotional and mental. I, I suppose it's in my genes. I'm a survivor. I've even after, not nearly as, as uh, brutal and trying, but I survived a lot of uh, corporate takeovers. I know how to basically dodge bullets. It, it's, some of it is just an instinct. And I'm here. And, and another thing, I was, when I tell my story, and I think with some justification, people can call me tough, and I was tough. But the dividing line between tough and callous is not a bright line. And to survive what you witnessed and what you experienced in the camps, you had to adopt a degree of callousness. You had to kind of put your head down and bowl through, bowl through the days, one day at a time, and more or less ignore what was happening around you. And uh, I think that that certainly contributed to my being able to deal and survive. Uh, the really <laughs> sensitive people could not make it. They just, they, they just, not just the physical deprivation, but the horror, the brutality, the dead bodies strewed all over the place was just too much for them. And as I say, I kind of put my head down and bowled through. What would be your advice to like current Americans to prevent something like this from happening again? Well, I believe in this country. I believe in its ideals. I am really quite sure that this could not happen in this country. Uh, and, and I think that the Holocaust and similar brutalities that have happened since have, have brought the lesson home of what can happen to even a civilized people like the Germans who had philosophers, writers, composers of the first degree and what happened. And I think that, that our, our society has learned a lesson about it. Unfortunately, in the world, there are still brute, cruel and unspeakable things going on today. But I am just confident that this could not happen in this country. There will be, obviously, bigots everywhere. Uh, but uh, that is not what this country is and the people in it. Her father was an American soldier who liberated, so she just thanks you for oh. sharing your story. Well, I, I, owe, I owe him a lot, and I owe him a big time. In either of the camps, do you remember there being any music? And if so, what memories do you have around that? Actually, in Auschwitz, they organized uh, for an extra piece of bread people who were able to uh, who, who were able to play instruments, and they formed a band. Uh, there were several of these uh, bizarre things. On, on in in our. There were, the, 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 this band used to pra sing or, or perform uh, music every Friday on a band. And, and there was these other bizarre aspects was that, uh, let me see if I can read a segment out of my book.
th this is uh, actually this is the words. The words. The book is written. I participated in it, but I took a a third party approach because I wanted to get the message across that one of the methods of my survival was to pretend that all of these horrors were happening to somebody else. So this story is, Fritz is the narrator most of the time. And uh, here is a segment. We know from documentary photographs that over the main gate of Auschwitz, the Nazis had affixed the sign, Arbeit macht frei, works makes you free. In Bernie's barracks, stenciled on a rafter and adorned with colorful kitschy flowers, inmates could read the first line of a popular German folk song, Es geht alles vorüber, everything passes. This sentimental song, one of many I learned in my youth, is still sung today in German taverns when the mood is jovial. It promises that after every December, a May will surely follow. The song is usually sung toward the end of an evening of drinking, right before in another drinking song, when people link arms and sway back and forth in a heightened sense of solidarity. That macabre bit of interior decorating in Bernie's barracks faded at nightfall as darkness settled on their camp, cramped quarters and quite another song emerged, one composed by an inmate in Yiddish. Someone would start to sing it, then a second voice would join in. Soon most of the inmates would be singing if, if, and a few remain silent on their pallets, as Bernie recalls, to listen to the desperate cry for deliverance. And it's a, it was a Jewish tradition that on days of both joy and sorrow, some of the people who are kind of gifted making up instant poem songs start a line and others pick it up. And that was it. The song is described here in Yiddish, but the English translation is this. Oh, why and for what are you hunting us so? Where is, Father, your mercy? From heaven give a glance. To the Jewish children give a chance. Extinguish the fire and let it be enough. This song I heard just once on that one of the afternoons in my barracks in Auschwitz, but I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And this was to, going back to what was I was asked. There were these little jolly little things that were written on the walls and the bands and, and surrounded by death and the worst possible kinds of degradation and absence of human dignity. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there are a little bit of housekeeping, little program um, surveys on your seat. I have pencils and pens by the door. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.